So I'll call the meeting to order at 6.30, officially of the select board of Hubbardson. It is now official for those of you who have not seen the email, governor signed it. So we are now the select board of uh, Hubbardson. Ryan, would you read the uh, virtual meeting information and a reminder to everybody that with this meeting is being recorded digitally? Yes, thank you, Jeff. So pursuant to Governor Baker's remote staff 2020 order. Jeff, I'm just going to mute you when you're not talking. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 38, section 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Hubbardson Board of Selectmen will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town website. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via Zoom. In the event we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the town's website a comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, um, is anyone here for open session? My understanding is we have, we have no one for open session, is that correct? Uh, we have a few members that I know are here for a certain item. If anyone is here for open session, just type in the chat box. I don't see anybody, Jeff. Okay, seeing no one, we'll move on to the announcement. Um, Katie, frozen assets. Yep, frozen assets um, has officially started. So um, this is a community-based fundraiser that has twofold reasons behind it. Uh, one is to get people into the shops where you can find the forms. Uh, January is usually the hardest time to get people in the door for most of these small shops in towns. So by putting the forms in the towns, the goal is to get the customers in the door in hopes that maybe they'll buy a cup of coffee or some cookies or honey or a flat of eggs, you know, dinner for the fam, whatever, while they're filling out their form. So you go into the local shops, you get five guesses on when the outhouse will possibly break through the ice. The outhouse will be located at five Williamsville Road um, in the beginning of February. It is not out now, so don't you haven't missed it. It's not out there. It won't be out there till we're done collecting forms. Um, the Country Hand is kind enough to always allow us to use their pond over there right in the beginning of Williamsville Road. So go fill out your forms. We are asking for a $20 donation. Um, if you can't afford that, then uh, we will take any and all donations per form. Uh, we understand times, times are tough, but I'd much rather you go into the shops and say hi, get a cup of coffee, get a cookie, you know, and talk with our local, local shop owners so that way they know that, you know, there are people here that are willing to support them in the hardest time of the year for them to get people in the door. So you have a month, you have till February 1st to fill out your forms, and then after that it's a waiting game and you can see you know, what time we it ends up falling, the outhouse falls through the ice and uh, people will win prizes. So hopefully, you know, we'll get enough interest in this like we do every year that we keep it going for the next year. But the money does, any money that's collected for donations for the forms does go back to special events. So it helps pay for this event and any other events that I run in town. So get out there and fill out your forms. Thanks, Katie, very well said. Um, again, an announcement, community survey, Ryan. Hey, thanks, Jeff. So we um, are closing our community survey. We ran it for approximately a month. We ended up with 528 responses as of uh, last time I checked it about 10 minutes ago. So uh, pretty good response. Again, it's not a completely scientific survey, but I'll be presenting the data to the board and the community as another decision point for some of the big decision some data for some of the big decision points that we have coming up. Thanks to everyone who participated. Any comments or questions on anyone for this?
Okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, then we will move on to number th three presentations. And again, uh, FY21 tax title plan, Ryan. Okay, thank you. So this is a, a brief presentation. Uh, should only take five minutes for those who are waiting about uh, tax title plan. For those who don't know what tax title is, this is our tax collection efforts here in Hubberson. Uh, very important every year, something the Board of Selectmen likes to be annually reported on and uh, definitely a focus when we're a revenue challenge as we are right now during COVID-19. So the purpose of this plan is to uh, provide you and members, residents with uh, information about our tax collection efforts. So overall, I think some people would be surprised to learn that 99% of Hubberson residents pay their taxes timely, meaning we are looking for outstanding taxes on 1% on or less of the public. Um, the total amount after we did subsequent takings in FY20 that is still owed to the town, and this is all time, is $520,584. A lot of these are placed into tax title, which means we have liens on resident homes, uh, and the rest of it is uh, FY21 collection efforts that are that are not yet complete. Uh, we will be doing those tax title taking soon, as you'll see later in the report. Here is a brief explanation, and I do post this in on the town website for people to see our tax collection process. Most people are familiar with this. We start with preliminary tax bills and do an actual real estate tax bill after we set the tax rate that um, residents should have received for third quarter payments that are due February 1st. We receive most of our tax monies from people's mortgages and banks, although a good quarter of taxpayers do pay them in person or through the mail. Here are the different ways we collect taxes. The only change from years past is uh, right now we are appointment based. In town hall, we do our best to accommodate taxpayers, meet them outside if necessary. And if you call us, we will definitely uh, make arrangements to help you during, during these difficult times. Here's our five year tax collection rate. So you'll see 2016 20. Um, our collection rates are, as I, as I mentioned earlier, pretty strong. You can see them here to include 2020. Uh, we have less than 75,000 left to collect out of 7 million, which is, or $7,800, which is um, a, little, a little under 2% left to collect, which uh, we do end up getting about 1% by the time by the time we get into future years. So these are payments, tax title payments received. So once we take or put liens on folks' houses, we do continue our tax collection efforts. These are the uh, results of those efforts. We spend approximately $5,000 a year in tax title efforts. And uh, you can see that in most years, it pays off as we uh, remind folks that they owe taxes. In FY20, we saw we saw a dip. We can definitely correlate that to COVID-19 and some delays in in offerings of, of payment to people during the uh, spring pandemic. We the board of selectmen put some payments off, and that put us a little bit behind. But in FY21, we started to recover most of that. Halfway through, we're already uh, five times greater than we were last year. Okay, so the tax title is allowed by Massachusetts general law. Uh, we do have to file this with a state. It is a legal process. So what happens is we perfect a lien on um, folks' houses for the collection of unpaid real estate taxes. And this allows us to track uh, who still owes taxes. And we continue through our tax title plan, which I'll present very soon, to collect these monies that are due. Here's the basic process. The board's familiar with this. This is more for the public. We advertise and let people know that they owe taxes. We set a date and again, tell folks that through a letter that we are planning on taking. Uh, we establish a lien. We still attempt collection. And if necessary, we start a foreclosure process. As the board knows, a foreclosure process is very expensive. So we really try and focus on the early parts of the tax title process. And once we do reach out and work with residents, we often have success. Only the most extreme cases go to foreclosure. We have been working with the planning board recently to uh, target some of our long-term foreclosures where properties are, are ripe for something like affordable housing. 
So we've been using a, a multi-tiered approach to getting rid of our tax title. Here's a little bit more about our townwide approach. Uh, we do not issue permits, licenses, or other privileges to residents who are in tax title and all departments work with Sandy, our treasurer collector, to make sure that uh, those folks that are applying are compliant. And then I just mentioned the planning board is working with the tax collection office to try and target some lands that are suitable for uh, larger developments, particularly looking for affordable housing development. Uh, ideally, it would be senior housing development on some of our land that have been in tax title for, for many years or, or owe a tremendous amount of taxes without any indication that they're going to pay them. And this is what Sandy has been uh, just great about respectfully working with residents to get rid of our tax title backlog. You can see the results of her efforts with those collection rates. They're very high, especially compared to, to neighboring and peer towns. And these are the specific efforts that she takes. Uh, I work with her closely on executing this plan as it's important for our revenue production. And um, some efforts that we've added to this are letters from my office or other focuses like our planning board effort to make sure that we are really targeting those, those large payoffs using our legal funds in order to work on tax title properties that there's a good payoff if we were able to, to collect the taxes. And here's our FY21 tax title plan. So we will be sending letters to property owners who still owe taxes for FY20 uh, in January. So we'll be doing that this month. And then if they are unpaid and our collection efforts are unsuccessful, they'll be placed into tax title, which means we'll put liens on properties in March. We'll continue to file documents with the state to take ownership of properties valued under $22,862. This is called the land of low value process. It is extremely time consuming and tedious, so it's difficult. Uh, we often lose Sandy for a little bit as she focuses on these, but it is definitely cheaper than the foreclosure process and also uh, affords us more bang for our buck, as you would say. And then right now we are working with our tax title attorneys to resolve three properties that are in uh, the foreclosure process in land court. So land court can take a couple of years. And as I've mentioned a couple of times now is very expensive. So we, we are targeting certain properties um, and using sparingly our town assets to make sure that we are following up on these tax title problems. And this is how much ends up getting put into tax title. Uh, right now with FY20, we've just done subsequent tax, title, tax titles. That means those tax titles that are continuing from the prior year, um, they've already been taken and we're just adding to that total. So we haven't done this year's takings. Amazingly, Sandy only has 27 outstanding um, tax bills right now to put into tax title in March. And we are working steadily, her and I, to try and bring that number down even more, but that, that is a very low number historically. In conclusion, Sandy's doing a great job. Um, our taxpayers are doing a great job. We, we have very few people who don't pay their taxes, which allows us to focus on the very few who do. We try to target our resources on uh, some, some projects or some tax titles that, that will pay off, as I've said. And we do very much work with folks who are uh, unable to pay their taxes or are in financial difficulties in order to limit the burden. This isn't just a just the tax collection process. We do reach out and when we are able to contact folks, we work on payment plans that are allowed under law and try to work with residents to resolve the problem so that you know, we have a good, a good relationship with our taxpayers and aren't just targeting money. So that's a quick presentation. Uh, the board also has this report and I'll post it publicly. Um, if there's any questions about that report, I'd be happy to answer them or get you further information from Sandy. Hey, Ryan, I have a question. Yes. Do you know how many properties have um, been delinquent year upon year? Is, is there a small number of them? Or in general, are most of these properties that owe taxes, is it they miss a year or, or are behind on payments? So I'm just, I'm pulling a number out just for a conversation, but it's close, but we have about 70 properties that are consistently in tax title and a very large number of those are in the Pinecrest region. 
which are land of low value, non-buildable lots that either have been abandoned or people don't feel it's worth it to, you know, to keep up with the tax payments there. So we've been working with the Pinecrest Association to try and find a way to not take on liability for the town in terms of the um, condo fees, so to speak, the association fees that you'd have to pay. If we were able to, to be, if we were able to have that burden alleviated for the town, Sandy could focus heavily on using the land of low value process to take up those pieces of land and then maybe sell them to a butters or auction them off. Um, we have been working on that product for a while. It's, it's not simple. There's a lot of legalese to it. And we do have that one problem of uh, do we owe association fees? Um, but that's not a project that we're going to stop working on. If that was to go away, we would have only about 25 really delinquent tax cases to work on. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but each, each tax title case in land court can cost up to $5,000. So our entire tax title budget is $5,000. So we could, in theory, target one per year, but not do all these other collection efforts. So we are cognizant of the fact that we are collecting 99% of taxes with the methods that we're using and sparingly using the foreclosure process because um, although we do have some quote unquote big unpaid tax bills out there, we're collecting far more for less money the way we're doing it now. Thanks. Anyone else have any questions or comments for Ryan? Seeing none, we'll move on to new business. First item is the vaccination planning update from the Board of Health. So I'd like to welcome in Kathy Hinsgate. I understand she's here for the presentation. Yeah, and quickly, Hi. Kathy. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hi, Kathy. Go ahead. The Board of Selectmen um, asked me last week to provide information on vaccination efforts. I know that you've been working with uh, Mallory, myself, and, and all the different players and vaccination plans. So I thought it best to bring in you to talk about vaccination efforts and generally, and then obviously we have some COVID information to share as well tonight. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me on. Um, since December, when the possibility of vaccines were uh, approaching, uh, all members of the Board of Health agreed to form a subcommittee that we have additional meetings where we are working on the plans for um, vaccinating uh, the folks in Hubbardston as the state rolls out the guidelines. Uh, currently, uh, we are working with Rutland um, to have our first responders uh, get vaccinated at the Rutland's clinics. Rutland Board of Health has also agreed to store vaccines until we're ready to use them. They have lots of refrigerators and freezers that they got under a CARES Act grant. And we are one of uh, 11 other communities that are working with Rutland. Um, they have taken the leadership for this area. Uh, Gardner, Templeton are all working with uh, Fitchburg, which is another area. Um, so there's a couple things that we're in the process of doing. Um, the first being that for Hubbardston to be a vaccination site, we have put in an application and um, we need a medical director. Dr. Michael Stauder, uh, who was on the board in the past, uh, immediately stepped up to agree to be our medical director as a volunteer. So um, one of the things that I need from you tonight as the selectman is an approval of his appointment as a medical director for the town of Hubbardston Board of Health. Um, our meeting is tomorrow night, so we will prove him officially tomorrow night through the Board of Health, but there have been no objections um, stated prior to the meeting. So I don't anticipate a problem. Um, <clears throat> we are working uh, via email with Jill Peterson, the principal at the elementary school, because that will probably be the location um, where vaccine 
clinics would be held in Hubbardston. Um, we're also looking at having uh, satellite um, vaccine clinics for senior citizens at the Hubbardston House as well. Um, so we are um, have about 1,945 seniors who are 75 and over. So we're really gearing up as quickly as possible to have um, our town be a site for vaccinations um, for these folks by February, because that's the state guidelines currently of when they can get vaccinated. Um, the vaccines that Rutland obtained are the Moderna vaccines. And um, so if that continues to be the source for uh, through Rutland for our vaccines, that will be much easier for us. Um, we have a, an old vaccination fund of over $18,000 in the Board of Health revolving account that we're intending to use as needed for um, supplies and, and anything else that we need to run clinics. And we intend to run clinics um, as needed when the various age groups can, you know, are able to be vaccinated. And I think that as of right now, I think we have 14 active cases. This is the last I knew. Um, and for the town of Hubbardston, uh, about 75, 71 total cases since COVID um, stats were started. And um, we still have folks in town who won't wear masks and it, I find it very frustrating. So anyone you see, just if they're doing the right thing, thank them. And uh, if they're not, encourage them to wear their masks. So uh, the good news is we are not high risk on the state's list. We are one of the few towns that are not on the high risk um, list that runs across the bottom of the television screen during news hour. So. Congratulations to Hubberston for being as careful as we are. Uh, we'd like to see no cases, but obviously that's not gonna happen. So I, I'm asking the board to um, approve Dr. Michael Stoddard as a medical director for the Board of Health. That's the big thing. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I was the one who asked for this information uh, at our last meeting. I appreciate you getting all this together for us. Um, would you repeat one thing that you mentioned in your presentation? When will the uh, senior citizens get their vaccinations? When? I'm sorry, I've lost connection. Where will they get it? So there's, they will be able to get it probably at the elementary school and also probably at the Hubbardston house. Do, do we do you know, Ryan, to appoint Mike? Yeah, we're gonna take care of that right now. Thank you, Kathy. I want to thank Mike for uh, coming forward on that. So I'd like to ask someone on the board to make a motion to uh, accept the appointment of Mike Stoddard as the medical director of the Hubbardston Board of Health. I think Chris has a question. I've got a question. Um, do we know what the supply and demand are for the vaccination? This, the demand? The minimum that the state will requires you to have is 200 uh, participants wanting vaccinations in order to be a site. Um, right now, Rutland's first responders uh, vaccine clinics have uh, about 150 openings. Uh, because I went on the site to try and uh, see what was available for clinic days this week. And um, 
I found it very slow to sign up on their particular sign up system. Um, and maybe that's why there's so many openings. Also, today's the first day available to sign up. So um, hopefully those slots will fill quickly. Um, the actual demand um, by people in town, that's not a known. I don't have a number on that right now. Is that something we should be looking at uh, since we've applied to be a site that should we, should we be proactive and try to find out the, what the interest would be? That is a good thought. Um, we'll discuss that tomorrow at our meeting. Um, even if it's just 50%, which is often the average being stated at um, statewide and nationally, that would still certainly be well over 2,500 people. And therefore, we should go forward and do that and help make it easier for folks to get vaccinated. If you could bring that up at your meeting, uh, I'd be interested in what the reaction is. Okay. Th thank you. Uh, again, could someone on the board, if they'd be willing to make a motion for Mike Stoddard, the medical director of the Huddleston Board of Health. I'll make the motion to appoint Mike's, Dr. Michael Stoddard for uh, medical director for the Board of Health. I'll second that. Motion's been made and second. Is there any uh, questions, any discussion? All in favor then, um, Katie? Yes. Chris? Yes. Pat? Yes. And yes for me, that's unanimous. So Kathy, you should be all set there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we intend to um, submit our application on Wednesday of this week for um, becoming a, an approved site by the state. We'll keep you uh, informed of uh, anything that we know. Thank you, I appreciate that. And thanks again for your, all the effort to give us the information you've provided tonight. Seeing, uh, does that finish us for the um, planning, the vaccination update? All right, Kathy, thank you. You're welcome. Economic development. Okay, uh, the, we'll move now to the, um, let's see, town update. Do you want to do that now, Ryan? Uh, for COVID-19? Yes. Yep. Okay, so uh, the biggest news we have in terms of COVID-19 today is, unfortunately, we had to uh, close down our senior center today, effective today. We are closing it for at least two weeks until January 25th, which is two weeks from today, a Monday. We had an employee test positive for COVID-19 uh, with some close, some close contacts with some of our seniors. And out of an abundance of caution, we are, we are closing the senior center in consultation with the Council on Aging. Uh, this is not what we wanted to do. There's a balance of need here between our seniors receiving services and being able to leave their homes and then protecting that population from, from a disease where the, the mortality rate is a little bit higher in our, in our more experienced population. So um, not great news. We're hoping that we can reevaluate and perhaps continue services. We will be continuing the delivery of food for, for our seniors that need uh, food assistance. That's gonna continue. That's an outdoor activity. The volunteers will be um, strictly following COVID-19 guidelines and making sure that uh, everybody who receives food does so in a safe manner. In terms of town hall, we sprayed the town hall tonight to make sure that there was no uh, lingering impacts from, from our COVID-19 exposure. This was appreciated by the employees for sure and done again out of an abundance of caution. So we disinfected and sprayed the entire all surfaces within the town offices to include the police department, the senior center, and the library basement. So this is um, 
you know, just an unfortunate reality. We did, we will be using the CARES Act fund for this. That's what it's for. And we will be returning to work tomorrow. The staff, I have given the staff the ability to work from home and monitor symptoms in case they feel they were exposed uh, during the last week. And um, I do would like to know from the board if we're going to strictly follow our appointment only services right now, meaning if you don't need to come to town hall, we're, we're going to close our doors and only do appointment only. I'm trying to keep from closing town hall completely. I think our employees are productive in town hall and some residents do need to come and, and take advantage of our services. I'm looking to see if the board has any different opinion on that. If um, many, many towns are closing their town halls completely. So um, if there's any comments there or, or general questions, I'd be happy to answer those before we get into the report. Well, it seems to me, as you were saying, if, if we, we move to having appointments, that would, uh, preclude then just having anybody happen to walk in and just to say hello or whatever. It might be the best thing to do is to have, have people that have appointments. Anyone have thoughts on this? I think, I think, you know, we should, we should default to the people who deal with it every day. Right. I mean, I'm not in the building all day long. One's the comfort level of the people who are there and, What's the traffic going in and out of the building? And what's the best solution for everybody's safety? And to be clear, we are we are appointment only right now. We've done our very best to accommodate people who come to town hall. We try to meet them outside. You know, I've provided notary services on people's car hoods before. Uh, we're doing everything we can to try and provide the same level of service. The problem is some residents, um, some residents demand that we be open and they, they wanna come in and we have to say no. So that, that will get back to the board and some of our town officials that you know some people are unhappy that they, they can't continue to use town hall as they want to. The problem that we have is if we have a COVID-19 outbreak in our finance department, let's say, you're going to lose your treasurer, your tax collector and your town administrator for two weeks into a full remote status. And God forbid we have one in our public safety department, we will be relying on other towns or mass state police to cover to cover our offices. So I, I just want it to be clear to the community that this is truly a preventative measure. It's not, it's not extreme. We're not, we're not afraid of the virus. We're just trying to keep services going the best we can while um, close contacts alone force by law quarantines of up to 14 days. So this is kind of a middle ground. I'm trying very desperately to not close town hall. Some of our peer towns are doing that and um, I think it's a good symbol and, and productive for our employees to stay at work, but this is coming. It's not getting any better. The, the numbers are going up and it's, it's a reality we might have to face. To uh, Chris's, I go suggest, ahead, Chris. I suggest we stay the course and we continue to do what we're doing. And if we have, you know, let's deal with those disgruntled citizens who are disappointed that they can't have access to town hall for the greater good of all the residents of Hubbardston. Right. And I'm not looking I would agree to with you. I'm just looking to share information. So no, I would agree I would agree with Chris and I would I would just turn it back to you Ryan and the people who are there every single day uh, doing what is comfortable for you folks. So so keeping it as it is I I for one also agree with Chris. Okay, um, the last bit, I'm going to share the current, the most current data we have uh, as has become a standard at these meetings. So Hubberson right here, okay, we are a green status community. Definition of green is more than 10, but less than or equal to 15. So if you notice, we are at a case count of 15, meaning one more case and we would be yellow. Um, yellow doesn't carry any, any dramatic significance, except that it's more than 15. However, um, you're approaching a red status where positivity levels start to indicate drops in our ability to provide services, say keep town offices open or starting to consider school services and definitely library services. So 354 Hubbardson residents have been tested in the last 14 days. 16 of them have been positive for a positivity rate of 4.52%, which is higher than it was last week. So numbers are, we're going down for one week and now they're going back up. However, compared to our peer towns, 
Um, Princeton is yellow and every other town around us is red. So as Kathy mentioned, uh, you could take that as a sign that Hubberson is, is following the rules, but it's more likely than not that um, we aren't seeing the type of large outbreaks that can happen when you have community areas where people can share space. But something to monitor as um, a lot of the amenities people use to, to sustain life are not in Hubberson, they go to other towns. So uh, we are surrounded by red and um, doing our best to stay in this green or yellow status. And that is the that is the weekly COVID-19 report. Uh, one piece of personal news, I received the Moderna vaccine myself uh, through the military this weekend. My arm is killing me, but it's it's not too bad. Um, I highly recommend if people have the ability to get the vaccine that they do. Our first public safety official firefighter received the vaccine on today, received it Monday. And the majority of our public safety officers will be receiving the vaccine by Wednesday. So it's starting to come into town. Um, we know there are mixed feelings about the vaccine, but overall, uh, people are taking it. And hopefully, we build up the type of immunity soon that can allow us to not be having these discussions every week. And Ryan, the Moderna is two doses also, correct? Yes, yeah, so I'll be getting my second one in early February, which I'm not here to promote the science statistics, statistics except I'm a town official and, and supposed to lead by example. So I'll tell you that I'm 40 to 60% immune after four to five days, and then up to 99% after that booster dose. So I'm hoping I can go to the movies at some point. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Shall we move on yes. to the uh, Economic Development Committee update? I understand Whitney Freiberg is here to uh, give us the report. Yes. Whitney, if you want to join us. I'm sorry. My dear friend Whitney, can you hear us? Hello? That's better. We can hear you now. It went to, hey, everyone. Hi, Patrick. Haven't seen you in a while. Oh. Been missing. <laughs> <laughs> We've been missed for sure. Uh, well, thank you all for uh, inviting us to, uh, to come tonight. I think this is a great opportunity, and I'm going to fill you in on a couple of uh, the projects that we're working on. Um, uh, some are a larger scale and some are a bit smaller and uh, would uh, appreciate some of your feedback. And so uh, uh, one of the uh, projects that we're working on currently is uh, a possible change in the zoning bylaw. We're waiting for the results from the survey regarding increasing or not the percentage for home businesses uh, as well as increasing or not the amount of non-resident employees. And we will make our recommendations based on those results. Uh, I think that uh, Katie had uh, gotten some feedback recently on one of the Facebook pages. Um, and I don't know if she wants to add anything to that. I would not call that feedback. It's more of <laughs> people chiming in their two cents. That is not any kind of yeah, no, let's wait for what the survey says. <laughs> okay, we'll do. Um, and, you know, and our reason for that is, you know, we recognize the uh, the growing amount of home-based businesses, and we feel that, uh, that, that they're, you know, they're really valuable to the community. And so we want to be able to uh, support that um, as much as we can. Any questions about that? Any comments or questions from the board? No, okay. Our next project that we're currently working on is uh, uh, fulfilling the homework that Katie requested in, in locating neighboring towns with uh, town center or commercial overlays. Uh, unfortunately, there are none that abut us uh, or neighboring, so we're gonna need to expand our search. 
Um, we, I'd also like to talk to our committee about looking into a grant for assistance to see if their planners might have information to share with us on those towns and then be able to visit one or two of them to look at things such as aesthetics, walkability, safety, the home-based businesses, wayfaring signs, et cetera. And I'll discuss that with our, uh, our committee at our next meeting, uh, which uh, I think is a week from Wednesday, and uh, we'll report back to you. But which reminds me um, that I'd like to find out uh, from you how you would like some reporting from us. Would you like us to submit monthly reports to you or something less frequent or? What's the feeling of the board on this? Well, I'm at the moment, I don't know what's going on anymore. I will let you guys what you'd like to know and when, so. I think, I think a monthly report would be good. Okay. That's, that seems fair to me. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think, I think that it's always good to have a paper trail rather than just, you know, things being relayed. Um, in the event that there needs to be uh, any documentation. So we'll, we'll, we would have that ready for you. Okay. Uh, next project that we're working on and I'm hoping uh, to be done by March is finalizing the uh, Hubbardston Small Business Guide. I'm still waiting for some of the replies from department heads. I, I sent out an email uh, with a PDF file of the current uh, uh, guide and there's a, quite a bit of information we felt as a committee, we felt that there was quite a bit of information missing from, uh, uh, from these uh, departments that would be useful and helpful to uh, potential business owners. And so we wanted to, uh, uh, to have as much transparency and as much information available. And so as soon as that's done, we'll go ahead and, uh, and finalize it. And, uh, and at some point we'll talk about uh, uh, cost for uh, for uh, printing and that kind of thing, but uh, PDF is al also a way to get it out to uh, people who are requesting it. And uh, I will follow up with those departments that have not responded yet and uh, and try and get that done ASAP. And if possible, they could also include a link uh, if you know if that's germane to to them uh, to any bylaws that you know would refer to that that could be included in that in in that guide as well. But the guide has, uh, there's been a lot of requests for it. And uh, I think it's something that we want to uh, get finished uh, quickly. Any comments about that? No, I think uh, the sooner the better on behalf of the small businesses. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that. I'll say that again, please. I was simply saying, I think um, sooner the better on behalf of the small businesses. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we're also putting together a, um, a uh, uh, our next meet and greet. Uh, we had our first one actually in September of uh, 2019. And uh, so we're a little behind due to COVID, uh, but we'd like to do this uh, meet and greet in March and we would like to do it in a question and answer format. So we would like to invite <clears throat> the uh, department heads, as well as uh, the re uh, business owners to attend. Um, and and the, the questions will have to be pre-submitted because certainly, you know, uh, there are a lot of questions that can't be answered right on the spot. And, um, and we don't wanna put anybody on the spot with that. So we wanna give our department heads enough time to research any of those answers and uh, and have those business owners ask uh, the questions and, uh, and, and, and go from there. And I think it's a good idea. We have a lot of comments from our business owners uh, about um, getting you know, some, some real specific information that can't be found in other ways. And I think this is a good way to, to, to get some of those answers for them. Whitney, I'm assuming when you were saying a meeting in March, you're talking about a Zoom meeting. <laughs> Yeah, it would absolutely, and, and, and especially I think in this format, that would be perfect. 
that would be perfect. So the questions would be submitted in enough time. You may, you know, before, before the event, and those, uh, you know, are invited to participate in the event. And if there are questions that can't be answered, you know, some follow-up questions that can't be answered on the spot, uh, the department heads would then uh, respond to the EDC and we would email the answers to all of the participants. So there would be follow-up to everything as well. But the idea is to get, you know, a number of questions in. We're not inviting uh, the participants, the uh, business owners to ask new questions at the event. The questions will be pre-submitted. There'll be a list of them, but there can be follow-up questions to each question. And then any that can't be answered, like I said, will be uh, forwarded to the participants once we get the answers. And we'll see how the person goes. And it's, it's successful and it's, and it's a value. Uh, you know, we might uh, keep that on our agenda and, and do that, you know, maybe once a year, something like that. Maybe not under the meet and greet, but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, fit it into our schedule for sure. I'm hoping that all the department, all the department heads will approve. Um, yeah, I'm hoping that they will. I'm sure they will. I'll get some help with that, I hope. You will. Okay. Any comments about that? Any thoughts about that? I didn't hear the last part of that. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I, uh, I was just asking if there were any questions about this. Again, I didn't. Are you asking if anybody has comments or questions? Because I couldn't uh, understand what you were saying. Yes. Ryan has his hand up. <laughs> Go ahead, Ryan. Just trying to not step all over Jeff here. So the, um, I would encourage the board to think of, in, in addition to welcoming businesses and being just a, a wonderful liaison for the community, the Economic Development Committee, the same way that you look at your, your Capital Planning Committee. So the board has asked and, and looked at one of their goals how can we increase business in town? How can we increase services but not increase taxes? What would that look like if we were to, to increase business, say, in the town pit or along Route 68? These are all projects that the board has considered. When we get to these meetings, the, the board doesn't really have time to dig deep into the weeds on, on, on these issues. So the EDC does that for you. You created it for that reason. So some of the things they said tonight, like a town center overlay, that, that's the easiest way to allow certain types of businesses or, and change you know, what's allowed on Route 68 from, from residential to, it doesn't mean that you're allowing you know, Target and CVS and all of these things. It means that, that you're creating a district for certain businesses that would be Hubbardson friendly. So the EDC has really been looking at that. And uh, as, as Whitney said, comparing to other communities and maybe using a grant to, to look at it more, I think what I'm hearing, they're looking for kind of feedback, and it doesn't have to be tonight, but feedback from the board on what type of overlay would you support, or is an overlay the right way to go, or do you have other ideas in terms of, of how to grow business? And that way, the that EDC can look at these things that you're, you're looking for and, and perhaps create a recommendation for you that we can execute uh, as, as a board. So that's just my input on, on the power of the EDC and harnessing these great volunteers that want to do this work so that you can get a recommendation and, and get something done, you know, maybe for, it doesn't seem likely maybe for this town meeting, but it could be if the process works and is sped along um, and is in agreement with all the boards to include the planning board. So Ryan, is this something we should uh, schedule on our, our a meeting uh, coming up soon, or how urgent is it to, for us to discuss this and pass it on down to the economic development? So not to speak for them, but 
Um, you can all communicate with them individually, you know, what you'd like to see for the town, what you're hearing from residents. And then this monthly report or check-in, it would be really beneficial in talking to some of the members of the EDC if you know, if they're going down a path that you're not going to support, or if they're not doing something that you want them to do, to kind of feed that information through Katie, who's on the board, but also individually, so that their work can be really productive, because anything they've taken on, they've taken on full steam. And I, I think it's a powerful tool to to get things accomplished. That sounds good. I'm sorry. When, excuse me, when are they going to compile the results of the survey? So we kind of know the attitude of the townspeople on changing anything before we dig too deep into this. So that's me, I'm doing the comp compilation um, and that'll be presented to you on February 1st at your meeting. Okay, thanks. Any other comments or questions for Ryan or Whitney? I have a couple more things. A couple more things I just want to share with you what we're working on. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we're still looking for additional sponsors for the Welcome to Hubbardston signs, and clearly COVID has had an impact on that. Uh, we do have uh, we have a sign sold. Uh, we have two signs sold, and um, and uh, we will. Uh, uh, we were kind of hoping that we might be able to do some in person. Uh, uh, contact because we're asking uh, people for a, a, a range in price from uh, some signs are $1,500 for the year sponsorship, some are $2,500. And I feel that when you get to, you know, to that amount of money as personal or in person as you can be is, is beneficial. Uh, if that's impossible, then we'll continue uh, uh, per, possibly by phone. The only thing that we have done so far is to send out a uh, a, a flyer with information about it, and I emailed that to all of the uh, uh, local businesses, um, and and got a few responses. Uh, they've spoken to us about uh, having more than one sponsor on a sign so that they can share the cost, and we're going to revisit that at one of our meetings coming up soon, depending on what the sales will be at that at that time. So that's it for the, uh, for the signs. And then um, I'm also putting together an inventory of, of available commercial or business spaces and uh, speaking with some of the landlords about repairs, et cetera, uh, perhaps to ready them. And then I'd like to uh, uh, start advertising those spaces. I feel that perhaps in the past, you know, there, there's been such a limit that people have just passed over Hubbardston thinking, well, there's nothing there, you know, nothing available there. Uh, in fact, we have several spaces open. I know that uh, they just about all of them need some work done on them. But if we could, uh, you know, reach out to the landlords and 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 appeal to them, uh, it would be beneficial to them as well. And if we could get something going with that, I'd like to uh, start advertising those spaces. And I think if people start hearing that there are spaces available, that word will get out as well. So I'm I'm working on that myself with the with the landlords and the and the spaces. And uh, that's about it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Again, anyone have a final question or comments for Whitney? But well, we'd like to thank you for all your, the effort you're putting in and keep up the good work. We're looking forward to your next report for us. Well, thank you very much. We're we're uh, we're happy with the volunteers, and we're uh, you know we're real proactive and and. I think we all love this town. So call on us when you need us and we'll talk with you soon. Thank you for the invite. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Whitney, and thank all the members of the committee for us too. All right, uh, we'll move on to uh, Public Library Foundation assessment. Uh, we'll turn that over to Ryan. This one is is pretty quick. I just want to give the board an update since uh, a lot of work is going on here. So we had Johnson Structural Engineering. This is all blessed off by the trustees and is being run by the trustees. I'm just bringing it to the board because it'll be uh, conversation pieces for CPA funding and other capital projects. 
So Johnson Structural Engineering looked at, they dug some test pits as, as we talked about last time, looked at the foundation of the library and also some of the grading in front and have this report that I put into your folder. I'm not gonna, not gonna read the report verbatim, but they did a great job for us. Um, they worked hand in hand with Tom Robinson as the representative from the, from the library trustees and really did a good analysis of the building. The foundation being the most important part making sure that that building is, is in good shape as it is very important to the town. So these pits revealed not as much damage as, as was originally thought, but there is some work that needs to be done to make it watertight and make sure that uh, further damage isn't completed or occurring. And to shore up, especially this corner here, which you all recognize as the walkway between the Slade building and, um, and Main Street. So what's next with this? We have worked with the DBW to see what work they might be able to do in terms of grading in the front. Also had a local contractor come and look and give a quote on, on what it would cost to grade the front. The reason for the grading is the, the levels have gone above um, the foundation, the stone foundation where, where it's causing damage when water pools around. So if we were to lower the ground and tie it to say the town center project and make it a nice smooth drainage in front of the building, it would lessen the impact on, on some of the foundation. Also, there needs to be some repointing work with the masonry. So overall, we are reaching out to an engineer or architect to build a project and see if we can't fund that with existing funds that have already been approved for the CPA or potentially ask for a little bit of additional money to complete this project. So overall, the project is running really well. If you have any uh, comments on the on the report, please let me know and I'll continue to update you on the trustees work in this regard. Um, I think that building's in good hands. They're doing a good job thinking about how we can tie it into the capital plan and some long-term planning to make sure that it's it's solid. As far as funding of this, would this be a grant of some sort or would it have to be budgeted? The town has already approved $18,000 of CPA funds in two different votes. So right now, the, um, the, the Capital Planning Committee last year wanted this reporting done and this analysis done in order to see the, the bigger scope of the project. So that's being completed now and is, is well within budget. Some of the repair work can actually be done with the 18,000 that's already been approved. And the library has gone ahead and put in a CPA application for any additional funds they might need to complete this project, small dollars under, well, not small dollars, I hate saying that, all dollars are important. Anything under $20,000, any, any repairs being under $20,000 for this next application. So um, I, I think that's well within the scope of what this project is gonna cost. At one point, we thought this might be 50, 60, $70,000. So um, it's going well. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned, Ryan, that part of that might be able to be handled with the town center uh, project, or was that just something that might happen? So the way they're looking at the project, grading it so that it meets what the town center project is trying to do in terms of the sidewalk reconstruction and the road repair, rather than looking at as two projects, they're really looking at seeing how the two can tie together so that one project drains into the other without damaging either. Just as an example of, of the level of detail they're looking at making this, making this repair last. In addition to future plans that the library has to, once the town center is complete, beautify the front of the library and work on some of the old stone to make it you know, appealing as part of the town center project. Thank you. Any uh, questions for Ryan on this or comments from anybody? S seeing none, Ryan, do you have anything else to add? Then we'll move on to FY22 classification compensation plan. And again, we'll ask Ryan to take over. Okay, so the board has completed negotiations with all of its unions. Although we haven't signed contracts yet, we are 
we are in a good place with our unions, uh, labor peace as they call it, and are working on finalizing these contracts, which will be public very soon. The, the last piece for me to understand before the budget process begins in earnest is the non-union side. So typically the board votes on a classification and compensation plan. This allows us to hire people at certain rates that are pre-identified by you. Anybody that I appoint, I put on this scale that's, that's approved by you annually. By charter, this would be done by the Human Resources Advisory Board, but that, that's a type of board that not many towns are using anymore. And it's sort of a bridge between the pre-charter Hubberston of being run fully by boards and the post-charter Hubberston, which is um, a town administrator form of government with uh, board oversight. So without a Human Resources Advisory Board, passing this compensation plan falls on the Board of Selectmen with recommendations for me. So this plan, and I'm, I'm not looking for a vote tonight. I just wanted to explain it to you, have you dig into it, and then understand its implications on the budget. So classification means, and I know you know this, I'm talking more to the public right now, the different jobs that are available here in the town of Harborson, people we employ to provide town services. So we've placed them on a classification scale running from um, our, our Mark Van drivers to, to myself or a town administrator. And each person is classified. This was done by HRS, which is a human resources consulting firm and compared to peer towns to make sure that we are classifying like many other towns our size are. So in FY21, and I'm just gonna ask real quick that that jumped to, it should say Harvestin 2021 non-union pay plan, if someone could say yes or no. Yes. Great, thank you, Jeff. So in each step here in Hubberson, we have our each grade, which is the classification of the job. So let's take the Mart van driver. They would be hired at step one. And then each year they would move up a step if they meet expectations on their annual review. And between each steps is approximately 2%. So it jumps up 14 and then any year after that, the board would approve a townwide COLA, which is, is typically 2% here in Hubbardson to allow um, continued, continued wage growth over time. So the idea, just like with our union counterparts, we want our non-unions to annually receive the type of pay increases that will keep them here because training new employees is not only disruptive to town services, but very costly, more costly than say hiring someone correctly. So right now our scale is built so that and municipal municipal governments are exempt from paying minimum wage, but we've decided as a town that our minimum pay will be minimum wage here in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is increasing their minimum wage 75 cents over the next two years to get to $15 an hour by the end of two years. So if we do not increase this wage scale, then we will again as we were a couple of years ago, fall behind uh, cost of living adjustments. So what is typically done in communities is you could take this starting wage, which the whole scale is built off of, and increase it by say 1%. Oh, sorry, Jeff, showing my lack of math skills. Sorry, one second. All right, it's not allowing me to do this and this, but you could increase the entire scale of that did it there um, and offer a cost of living adjustment on top of the scales. So what that would do, what the implications of that are is anybody that was B2, I would be budgeting for them to be a B2 in the next fiscal year if you added a percent increase to the scale, that percent increase would be added to that employee's raise, so to speak. So with this 1% example, non-union employees would receive a 3% raise. So if you do nothing, you're recommending to me that we increase our non-union by 2%. If you do half a percent, it would be two and a half. If you did 5% on top, which I'm not recommending, it would be a 7% raise for employees. 
this impacts all of our employees now as all of us are on this scale except for the police chief. So why I'm showing this to you and why I'm bringing this to you is this is how I'm going to build the, the town administrator's budget for you. So all of the approved hours, will, we will use this scale in order to calculate wages for FY20, FY22. So if you want to make any changes to this classification and compensation scale, that would require a vote. If you want to keep it as it is, then I would build off this budget. Um, and this does not mean, and I know you're probably thinking this, the FinCom is probably thinking of this, and the public is, pending calamity and other types of fiscal constraints, we are not committed to making these types of pay raises. You could always freeze wages and not move people up steps if financial situation does allow. Um, this is just a conversation that, that you told me that you wanted to have. One of your budget goals was to focus on employee retention, which we did in the union side. So this is the non-union side and kind of the last piece of the puzzle before we build your FY22 budget. So that's a ton of information. I wanted to present it transparently to you and to the public so that you can vote on it um, on February 1st, unless you tell me you wanna vote on it right now. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, anyone have any feelings on this as far as voting on it tonight or should we wait till February 1st? So I just, I just have a question, Ryan. This is, uh, this is something you need to plan and base fiscal year 2022 budget on. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, so if you're going to use it just as a reference point and a starting point for budgeting, I think it would make sense for you to do that. And then we could review where the budget stands. And if it's something that's out of whack or something we disagree with, we can always revisit the, the increase scale like you suggested earlier in your presentation, right? Yes, that is, that is one way to do it. Okay. And I, as, as part of my budget presentation, I always show the board what the cost is for increasing employee pay. Employee pay is generally the largest. Focus point of our budget, not the large increase, the education, retirement, insurance. Um, but we'll do it most of those, and, and you've given. We were losing you there. Did I freeze? We were losing you a little bit there, Ryan, when you were explaining that. Okay, I'm going to head downstairs. So rather than make everyone sick, I'm just going to disappear for a second. All right, is this better? Sounds good to me. <laughs> I don't know where you lost me. Okay. So Chris. So you can start over. Remind me what I was answering. I'm, I'm trying to limit sound here. I was asking a question about what the what the fallout if we approve something tonight what we were locked into and i think you said that it was just something that would guide you to get your budgeting process for 2022 started but we could always make changes if the reality of the numbers come in different than we expect them to come in yeah so the, the biggest number we're going to get before 
before your next meeting, February 1st, is the local, the local aid number. So if local aid is level, meaning they approve the same local aid they did last year, I think overall we'll be in okay revenue shape, not great revenue shape, which would allow you to focus your increases on employees as you've, as you've stated as one of your goals. If that number is terrible, then, which is possible, it's supposed to come out January 27th, then it doesn't matter what we approve here. We're going to be looking for budget cuts everywhere. But what I'm looking for, generally speaking, is, is how do we want to pay our employees and what type of classification and compensation plan do we want to offer? Well, based on what you just said, as far as having that information for the next meeting, February 1st, is probably to our advantage to wait as far as not making any move on it tonight, since you'll have a lot more ammunition or information for us on the first. That's what the way I feel. Yeah, I agree. Let's wait till we have as much data as much data we can before we start uh, making decisions. Anyone else have any uh, comment on that, or do you all agree to, that we wait until the February 1st before acting on this? Yeah, I, I agree. Let's let's hold off till the 1st. Yeah, I'm fine with holding off. Okay, Ryan, uh, so we'll put it over to February 1st agenda. Answer already left. What, <laughs> what was that? There you go. Back. Was that you protesting our answer? You just left. <laughs> I've lost. I've, yeah. I lost the screen as far as the Zoom showing the members. All I've got something here saying scheduling made easy. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> So I'm incapable of either muting myself or seeing anybody else. Does anyone else have that problem? No, but we can hear you, Jeff. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know what made it just change like that. Ryan? I can tell you, Jeff. So you went from when I disappeared, you were, became the host. So you got a bunch of different capabilities. But now I, don't, I don't want them. <laughs> How do I get back to the, uh, the regular screen or can you get, get me back to it? You just hover on the bottom of your screen. You should see the, the same controls coming up. Uh, they're not. <laughs> well, anyway, let me pass this next thing on to you and then at least I'll be listening. Um, the employee benefits cafeteria plan, and uh, according to what you and I talked about earlier today, this will require a vote by the board. So Ryan, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so this one's pretty simple. The, the town of Hubbardson offers its employees benefits and our benefits under our cafeteria plan, which I, I put the materials in your, in your folder allows the benefits to be taken out tax-free. So annually you need to resolve or vote that we are going to approve our cafeteria plan. And this allows us to provide tax-free dental health and other benefits to employees. Um, there's no cost to the town. This is just helpful to the benefit, to the employees. So on in your folders, this resolution here is what you would be approving. One of these slipped by me. So you're resolving that um, the cafeteria plan as presented in your folders, which is the same as it is last year updated to this year, will begin for, for this calendar year, that employees will contribute their amounts to pay for it, and that we will take that out 
using our, our finance team tax free. So if you approve, you would be voting to uh, approve this resolve in the cafeteria plan and have Dan sign it. So um, can I ask for a vote then, uh, for a motion, or do you have more, Ryan? No, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the FY22 employee benefit and cafeteria plan as presented. I'll second that. Uh, should it be part of the motion besides just approving it and signing the document? Should that be in there also, Ryan? Your your motion is fine. Okay, motion made and seconded. Any uh, discussion? All in favor? Pat? Yes. Chris? Yes. Katie? Yes. And me? Yes. Who you need all our signatures, or is that signature going to be just yours, Ryan? I'll be sending it to Dan for to sign on behalf of the board. All right. Okay, we're moving on to old business, the high street reconstruction project. We're going to table that for the next meeting. So we'll uh, pass over on that. Um, we have uh, a appointment that we need to uh, take a vote for. So Ryan, you want to uh, fill in? Yeah, so we have uh, an employee in the DPW that is is currently um, injured and out. So we'd like to make a, and has been for a little bit and will be for a little bit longer. So we'd like to make a temporary appointment for Nick Beauregard. Nick applied in the last round of hiring. We really liked him. We ended up hiring Mike instead, who's been great. Uh, you saw his review last time. So we'd like to bring Nick on, train him on the department, have him help with some of the plowing and some of the the things that need to get done and uh, you know hopefully create a well-trained municipal employee for us in the future or for someone else but right now nick would be filling in and i'm notifying the board that we're going to appoint him temporarily as soon as our employee who's out comes back then this this uh, offer would be rescinded so i'll, I'll make that motion to appoint okay. i'll make that motion to appoint nick Temporary DPW driver. Waiting the 14 day waiting period, Pat. Sure. I'll second that. All right. Did you hear that, Pat, as far as the waiting 14 day? Yeah, and I said, sure, that's fine. Okay. Motion made and second. Is there any uh, discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Pat? Yes. Chris? Yes. Katie? Yes. And me, yes. Motion's carried. Um, next item of business, we have a brief TA report. Ryan, if you will. Yeah, most, I um, because we just did this last week, I didn't do a, a longer TA report, but the main information I had for you was the COVID information, and one of them you alluded to already, which is that the governor today signed uh, S2983, which is an act providing for the renaming of the Board of Selectmen to Select Board in the town of Hubbardston. So uh, as Jeff mentioned in the beginning of the meeting, you are now the Select Board of Hubbardston, uh, not the Board of Selectmen, which is a, a small but I think important gesture, one that will be more inclusive and allow for um, hopefully more volunteers in town looking to serve on, on the top executive board. Not that I'm trying to replace any of you, just saying if any of you move on, uh, we do need volunteers. So this, basically this entire act takes the board of selectmen out of the charter and replaces it with select board, which means I have a lot of work to do uh, editing the charter. And that's it. Besides COVID, that's the only uh, report I have. Any questions or discussion? 
Moving on. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we have no minutes to approve. Do we have any committee updates? Apparently not. Okay. Um, that is not reasonably anticipated by the chair. There are none. Yeah, there is one. Public press course. Oh, go ahead. Um, so I, we got this letter. I believe we all got this letter from Joel Shaw down on Gertie Lane about noise in the pit. Um, you know, he says he's raised this issue before um, and he's not getting many results. I'm not too familiar with the pit or what goes on. He says he hears dirt bikes down there. Um, a couple of points in his letter I wanted to clarify. He's talking about noise hour limits and time restrictions. Uh, do we have such a thing in Hubbardston as noise hour limits and time restrictions? To my knowledge, we don't. <laughs> I would have to research that. I don't know if the top of my I mean, have you have you all seen this letter? You've all got this letter, right? No, I haven't seen that. I, I haven't either. No, no I read it this morning. Yeah. So Chris, oh. I did I did get that letter. I um Unfortunately, Chief Perrin is on vacation right now. I did forward it to Chief Perrin to, uh, he, he said that he had spoken to Chief Perrin before, so I wanted to clarify that. Um, I also did mention to, um, I, should, I should say, I will mention to Sergeant Kucher that this is something that, that we would certainly like to look out for in the short term, meaning uh, to patrol in that area, but I would like a longer term solution or answer from, from Chief Perrin so that I can respond to the resident. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's what I think we should do. Right. I don't, I'm not familiar with the pit. I'm not, I mean, I know people that live down in that part of town who I have gotten some insight from about the situation, but you know, I don't know what we can do or what we're capable of doing to solve it. I'm sure chief Perrin will be the subject matter expert on that. We should hear from him for sure. But um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that we were, taking the letter at face value and pursuing pursuing this person's wants and needs and concerns in the community. So it's good to pursue that. So I never saw that. Can you forward that to me, please? Because I do not have that in my emails. I'll do it right now. I thought Thank you were on it. I, it I have no idea, I check my spam, so. But yeah, I didn't see anything in my uh, emails with that information. Done. Based, my, based on my visits to the pit over the years as a selectman, this is a problem that has been going on for some time as far as the dirt bikes, et cetera. Every time you go into those pits, you just see nothing but their uh, trails, if you will. Well, you do know you can get up to New Hampshire from here on trails, and a lot of people go through the pits. So, people, you can get all the way here. You'd be surprised. People like cut through. It's, I, you know, they've always been in the pits since longer than I've been alive. So, I mean, I'm not trying to make light of it, and I don't want to, you know, like I understand noise and everything else, but. I'm not sure, like I, I haven't seen the email, so I don't wanna, again, make light of it, but I don't even know which side he's talking about or which pit specifically, but I mean, they're not owned by us. There's no town sound ordinance. I don't think there ever will be, and it'll be very hard to enforce, even if you were to do that, and including like the cops trying to get the people out of the pits is extremely hard because the size of them it's one of those, it's an uphill battle, like coming and going. And I understand the people don't like the noise, but again, it's a very uphill battle. And I don't know be one that will ever be one just due to the size of the sand pits that are out there. And if that's the solution, if that's the solution, that's the solution, right? But 
we can only do what we can do, but, you know, let's get chief parent involved, like Ryan said, and at least address the concern and see what we can do about it, if anything, and let Joel and the residents down in that area of town know what we've done and what the extent of what we can do is. Yeah, there's so many back ends for those pits. It's insane. It's just a walk out there, which I never have because that would be considered trespassing. Um, but there's so many, <laughs> there's so many paths out there in the woods that you can get lost, turned around upside down and end up in uh, like, where the hell am I? And all of a sudden you pop out on a road and you figure out where you are and you're halfway across town at, on a back road. You know, it's, it's insane how many trails are out there. So it's, it's again, it's, they're not like entering the gates where like, oh, the cops can go in. They, you can't even get to where they're going, you know, where they're coming in and like, you can't get to it. So again, you're, it's, uh, I hate to say it, but it's a very uphill battle. And it's one of those things that I've, you know, just come accustomed to. It doesn't phase me a bit, but other people might be very annoyed by it, so. Okay, I know Chris wants to get to kickoff. So um, if anyone has anything else to bring before the, the board, if not, uh, we do not have executive session tonight. So um, we can, I'll look for a, a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion, motion to adjourn. adjourn. Thanks, Jeff. So move. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.